Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece again from Central New Mexico Community College. Here we're looking at video M in which we're concentrating on the process of secretion in the nephrons. Remember when we talk about secretion, we're now talking about the opposite process of reabsorption. So this time it is the blood that is going to get rid of some of its substances and return it to the filtrate. Or it might be that some substances from the epithelial cells are going to leave those cells and make it into the filtrate. So why would the blood want to suddenly return things back to the filtrate? Or why are substances from the tubular cells going to move into the filtrate? Well, this is a way to obviously get rid of substances that um, did not already make it into the filtrate. Um, to get rid of things that really don't belong in the blood. It's also a way for us to get rid of too much potassium ions and other ions actually. But really primarily it is a way for us to regulate the pH of the blood. Now you might say well don't we do that with the help of the respiratory system? And the answer to that is yes. But your kidneys also play a very important role in regulating acidosis and alkalosis. So let's take a look at that. Let's refresh our memory on what we mean by acidosis and alkalosis. So when the acidity levels in our blood begin to rise due to the accumulation of too many hydrogen ions or too many acids in the blood, of course, that represents a drop in the pH of the blood. That's going to stimulate the various brain receptors that we've learned about, chemoreceptors and receptors in our major arteries, such that our respiratory centers are going to tell us to increase our breathing and therefore blow off carbon dioxide such that we reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood if we do that, we're also reducing the amount of carbonic acid and of course that means we reduce the acidity and we bring up the pH and we restore our acid-base balance. And of course the opposite is the case in order for us to fix alkalosis. So we can either blow off more carbon dioxide to get rid of too much acidity in the blood or we can literally slow down our breathing to hold on to more carbon dioxide and therefore elevate our acidity levels if they were too low in the blood. Our kidneys too can help with regulation of pH of the blood. And once again, they can fix acidosis or alkalosis by changing the, the amount of acidity that develops in the blood or carbonic acid for instance by regulating literally the bicarbonate levels. So acidosis regulation is going to occur by means of uh, bicarbonate reabsorption. I forgot to add this here. So this should say reabsorption of bicarbonate ions and then hydrogen ions will move in the opposite direction and be secreted. So by getting rid of these hydrogen ions we're going to allow for our pH to be reestablished in the blood. And we'll see how the secretion of these hydrogen ions might also lead to the formation of ammonium ions as well as phosphate ions or dihydrogen phosphate. On the other hand, if we need to fix alkalosis in the blood, we're going to see that this time we'll reabsorb hydrogen ions and get rid of our bicarbonate ions. So we can fix the acidosis of our blood by reabsorbing more bicarbonate ions into our blood from the filtrate. Well, but that's not so straightforward because our bicarbonate ions that were filtered out from our blood in the glomerulus cannot get reabsorbed directly. What needs to happen is that the bicarbonate ions that are in the filtrate must first be converted back to carbon dioxide. 
and then the carbon dioxide can diffuse into our tubular cells. Once the carbon dioxide is in the tubular cells, it can bind with water, carbonic acid is formed, as you know, and then we finally have our bicarbonate ions along with our hydrogen ions. The bicarbonate ions are now going to be able to diffuse into our blood and the hydrogen ions can be secreted. So let's take a closer look at how this all works. And by the way, once again, for every bicarbonate ion that's reabsorbed into our bloodstream, we're going to exchange that for chloride and other uh, negatively charged ions. We're looking here at the proximal convoluted tubule again, despite the fact that most secretion actually occurs in the distal convoluted tubules and even to some extent the collecting ducts. But it does happen in the proximal convoluted tubules, even to some extent the loop of Henle. Um, and so we can, we can use this image. Just bear in mind that in the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct, we are going to need the help of a hormone, particularly aldosterone, with the reabsorption of bicarbonate ions because it's going to be, uh, these ions are going to tag along with sodium. Let's take a look. So here we have our tubular cell, our interstitial fluid, our capillary, our filtrate. And um, you can see that I have given you some numbers to easily follow the path of our process. Of course, this is very cyclic, so in a sense, it doesn't really matter where we, where we start. But let's just start here, and let's assume that we are secreting hydrogen ions into the filtrate. And in just a moment, we'll see where that hydrogen comes from. This hydrogen that is secreted back into the filtrate depends on an ATP pump, which pumps sodium in and, and hydrogen ions or protons out into the filtrate. Once we're in the filtrate, these hydrogen ions were, can combine with bicarbonate ions, and this then allows us to reform carbon dioxide. Remember what I said, these bicarbonate ions that we filtered out, they cannot get across our luminal membrane here or our apical membrane. Only if we have carbon dioxide can it diffuse across that membrane. So this membrane seems to be impermeable to bicarbonate ions. We have our enzyme, our carbonic anhydrase enzyme, hanging out in the microvilli here of our um, tubular cell so this whole metabolic process can occur pretty fast. Once the carbon dioxide diffuses into our tubular cell, there it meets up with water. We once again have our enzyme and we're recreating our bicarbonate ions. Once we have our bicarbonate ions, they can then, with the help of a sodium potassium pump, and notice that your book made a typo here, this should say potassium, not hydrogen. So with the help of the sodium potassium pump, as sodium is pumped out, bicarbonate ions in this case are going to be able to um, follow that electrochemical gradient that's created and then and ultimately end up in the blood and therefore fix the pH in the blood. Our hydrogen ions that have been formed are now going to be the ones that can be secreted by pumping and help us form our carbon dioxide in the filtrate. By the way, if we are suffering from acidosis, it does mean that we have too high of a carbon dioxide levels more than likely in the blood, so they're high. And so the carbon dioxide could actually also come from the blood and enter into our um, tub tubular cells that way. So whatever this picture illustrates is almost identical to what we just looked at. Notice that the carbon dioxide this time is showing to come from the blood. Again, we're thinking of a scenario where we're acidotic and therefore carbon dioxide levels could definitely be too high in the blood 
or the carbon dioxide could come from the filtrate the way we just learned it. And then carbon dioxide and water will combine and ultimately we end up with our bicarbonate ions that can fix the acidotic blood and the hydrogen ions are going to be secreted into the filtrate. Now in this scenario what we're seeing is that the cells of the kidneys can actually deaminate some of their amino acids. Perhaps there are too many of these amino acids or we want to convert an amino acid into something else. So here we're removing the amine group so that we form um, ammonia that can then uh, enter into the filtrate, combine with the uh, proton that was secreted. So now NH3 plus this proton forms ammonium. So to clarify, this is our ammonia and this ion is called ammonium, which is a nitrogenous waste that we can then excrete in the urine. Here we see one more example of reabsorbing bicarbonate ions, secreting hydrogen ions, like we learned in the very first um, slide, um, once we started discussing bicarbonate reabsorption, and this time we're going to use the hydrogen ions in order to get rid of phosphates uh, via the urine. So you can see that by secreting hydrogen ions, which ultimately allows us to reabsorb bicarbonate ions and regulate the acidity of the blood, um, we can in the meantime also get rid of other waste products, not just hydrogen ions directly. Now in these three last slides we focused on fixing acidosis by means of bicarbonate reabsorption and the secretion of, hyd of hydrogen ions which could ultimately lead to the secretion of ammonium or even phosphate. But bear in mind that of course sometimes we need to fix an alkaline environment in the blood and then all these processes are going to occur in the opposite direction. In other words, this time we're going to reabsorb hydrogen ions and we're going to secrete bicarbonate ions instead. And this is a brief summary of uh, the processes that occur in different parts of our renal tubule with a bit of a list of the substances that are going to be reabsorbed, for instance, here in the proximal convoluted tubule versus in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct, um, along with those things that are secreted. We're going to see that, yes, urea gets reabsorbed and then it gets secreted. Uh, why this is such an important feature and that has to do with the loop of Henle. We haven't said much about the loop of Henle where we do see water reabsorption and where we do see the secretion of salts, but we are about to discuss in great detail what role the loop of Henle plays in the formation of urine.